welcome back to the channel daughter of increase my name is Nate Denise for those of you who are new to the channel or who just happen to stumble across this video and to post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday all about my faith God Christ and expanding the kingdom of God today's video is going to be the final study for Ephesians we are going to be diving into the last chapter of Ephesians which is chapter 6 and I titled this the armor of God so the Bible that I'm using for this study is the single column journaling bible from crossway in the esv which is the english standard version translation you guys see that here i have the notes for ephesians here so if you don't have the notes you can definitely check the blog and get those they are ten dollars for 30 pages full of notes for each chapter um, I have my post-it notes and my notepad for extra paper just in case I need it. And I decided to use this emoji one just because I haven't used it yet and it's super cute and I figured why not. So I have my pens. My pen is the basic G-Flex oil gel pen. Oh, sorry. Uh, the oil gel pen that I picked up from like the discount store. And then my Micron Pigma 01, which is a 0.25 millimeter. Hopefully I can see that. I'm using blue ink today still. And then I have, obviously, my highlighting utensils, which are the Crayola Super Tips, um, the Zebra Mild Liners, Crayola Swissable Colored Pencils, and I believe, if I can find one, Sharpie Smear Guard. So these are the kind of things that I use to do highlighting in my Bible. So I'm going to do a quick, simple prayer Pray us in, and then we are going to tackle these 25, 24 sorry, verses. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for just bringing us together for this study. God, I'm asking that you enter into this study, that we may be able to take something from this study and apply it to our lives. Bless those who are watching it right now. Bless those who will watch it down the line, Father God, that this study may be able to help them change or see something that needs to be changed in their lives, Father God. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm working on my prayer life. So, yes. Um, okay, so I titled this The Armor of God because that's pretty much um, what I think of when I think of um, chapter 6 of Ephesians. Now, don't get me wrong, it still is a combination of what we discussed in chapter 5, which is about life in the spirit. Um, in chapter 5, it talks about walking in love and then the kind of the roles of like the wife and the husband. And then the beginning parts of chapter 6 talk about the relationship between children and parents as well as servants and masters. Then it goes into the whole armor of God. But um, let's just dive in. So if you are new to the channel, new to the study, the way I do my study, um, basically the way that I do it is I read paragraph by paragraph or section by section. In this case, paragraph by paragraph. So we would basically start off with the first four verses here, which is one paragraph. And I would read it, read it through without any markings, any underlining, nothing like that. I just read it through for context and understanding. Then I would go and circle words that I want to define. Then after I do that, obviously I would define them. Then I would go in verse by verse, breaking down the parts of the verses to fully be able to write my notes and get an, a better understanding of the verse within the context of the scripture, understanding the timing and things like that. And then I make my notes, box things, and add color to make everything look pretty, as you can see. And um, when I'm defining words, these are words that I do know and words that I don't know. And I do this because things that were written um, back during the time that the Bible was written were, they, they had different meanings. Um, you know, English terms don't always mean what they used to mean either in Greek or Hebrew and because this is Ephesians and it's in, and it's in the New Testament the New Testament was written in Greek so when I define these words I'm basically looking up the Greek word as well as the Greek definition not the English sometimes you can't find the Greek so I do find the English but majority of the times I'm pretty much successful at finding the words so as I said we are going to start off with the first four verses let me just move my wire out of the way okay so hopefully you guys can see this it's all in frame um it might be a little slanted i apologize this notepaper is going to be in my way so let me try to fold it back uh -oh. probably should have gotten this ready prior to 
Um, hopefully that works for now. Yeah. Okay, so this section is called Children and Parents. So it's basically a continuation of what we learned in um, Chapter 5. So if you haven't seen that, definitely check that out. But diving in, it says in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline. I'm sorry, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So the only word I have is provoke. So I am going to circle that because that is the word that i want to define and you guys already know i said this before i already did the definitions and everything so that this could be easier so i'm um, showing you guys here provoke if i can get this in focus the greek word is here but it means to rouse to wrath to make angry okay so i basically just wrote that there and what i'm going to do i want to use red for this so i'm going to box it in red and then add a matching color to the circle so that I know. Okay. So now that I have that out of the way, I'm going to now dive into breaking it down. So it says in the first verse, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. So basically, we as children have a responsibility to, to obey our parents as they have a responsibility to teach us obedience. So though it's telling us to obey in order for us to obey, we must learn what obedience is by example. Um, we don't need to teach our children how to disobey because they have um, inherited I'm sorry, you guys. We don't have to teach our children how to obey because they have inherited an inclination to sin from Adam. Um, but obedience must be taught. So, unfortunately, we, we you know we're born in a world of sin because of the things that Adam and Eve did. So, learning to sin is not some. Basically, it's, we don't have to learn to sin if that makes sense. Um, you don't teach a child to lie. The first thing you do, say, if you catch your child, like a two-year-old, um, sneaking to eat. A snack when they weren't supposed to you ask them who ate the cookie they will say not me someone else that right there is the first lie that most children tend to say um and it's not that we teach them to disobey disobedience is honestly kind of like a normal thing for the flesh um obeying is very hard our spirit likes to obey but our flesh does not so we're never um in a predicament to have to learn to disobey but we are supposed to be taught obedience and we can only learn that from our parents so that's why it's telling us to obey so um i just said a mouthful i know so what i'm going to do is i'm going to underline children obey your parents for this is right and i'm trying to figure out where i want to write that I'm going to try to squeeze it here, so. Have a responsibility. Okay. To obey. Your parents to teach obedience so basically I shorthand wrote my notes and I just said that um have a responsibility to obey and parents to teach obedience um, that's pretty much what I get but again I'll restate my notes um, I said that we as children have a responsibility to obey our parents as they have a responsibility to teach us obedience. We don't need to teach our children how to disobey because they have each inherited an inclination to sin from Adam, but obedience must be taught. And um, let me pull up some of these cross-references for you guys because I do have cross-references. If you have the notes and purchase them, you will see all the cross-references, but... Um, let me just, I don't know why I don't be organized. Uh, everything just be all over the place. So, um, I believe it's going to be Proverbs 6 and 20, but don't quote me. Give me a second. 
Yes, so Proverbs 6 and 20, it says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak for you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a lamp. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So that was actually Proverbs. I'm going to write that down. Proverbs 6.20. Six twenty to verse twenty three for that. Okay. I do have other cross references, but I'm just gonna stick with the minimum for now. Um going to verse two and three. So it says, Honor your mother and father. This is the first commandment with the promise, um, that it may go with well with you and that you may live long in the land. Um, pretty much that's from Exodus 20 and 12 and Deuteronomy 5 and 16. That's the cross reference for that. But, um, honoring our parents is a symbol of our honor and reverence of the father, the father being God. This commandment came with a promise. So it's beneficial to our physical and spiritual being. Okay. Um, children, this is basically how children walk in the light and how the spirit dwells within the parent child relationship. Okay. So I'm going to underline honor your father and your mother that it may go well with you live long in the land and then this is the first commandment with a promise so how am i going to do this so um okay obedience beneficial To physical and spiritual. Okay. We're just gonna go like that. And then for this part where it says honor your mother and father, um, I'm going to put Can you guys see this? Oops, sorry for shaking the camera. Let me just take the cap off. Um, so honoring parents is a symbol of honoring God. And it's pretty much how I said back in chapter 5 with the whole wife um, submitting to the husband. It's not so, it's not more about like the wife being submissive to her husband, but it's her reverence. It's basically her submission to her husband is her submission to God, same way as our obedience as children to our parents is showing our obedience and honor to God. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And the cross references are. Exodus twenty twelve, Deuteronomy five sixteen, because that's where that is from. Okay, then in first verse four it says, "Do not provoke your children to anger." I'm going to say that again. It says, do not provoke your children to anger. Um, so parents, this is, I think, mainly more so towards um, men because men are seen as like the harsher parent in the kind of mom and dad kind of duo. But um, I'm not going to just say fathers. I'm going to say parents in general should not provoke their children to anger because... Um, Parents are not to be unkind or overcritical or harsh or even abusive parenting that gives an unnecessary unnecessary justification to a child's um I'm sorry, I meant I meant to put something else. But basically parenting as such, which is basically unkind, overcritical, harsh, or even abusive, um, gives unnecessary justification to a child's natural rebellion. So, um, we are already born in sin. We're already used to and kind of familiar with sin. That is just what our flesh is used to. So obedience is something that we as children, definitely as children, find it hard to um, 
do. We find it hard to obey because the flesh is warring with the spirit. So when you have a parent um, being harsh to you, being overcritical, saying mean things to you, degrading you, being abusive, it is giving that child more justification to rebel um, because in their mind it's like, well, my dad beat me so that means i can just not obey him my mom cursed me out so that means i can be root back to her but again we're not supposed to be that way hopefully i'm making sense but um that's basically what i'm picking up from that verse so do not provoke your children to anger oh what am i gonna put that note i will write it on I'll write it over here. Um, so I'm gonna write verse four. I'm just gonna write it on the other page because I have space. So verse four and box it. Um parents. Should not be unkind, harsh, abusive, or overcritical. And when I say abusive, I don't mean like a beaten or getting popped in your mouth. I mean like actual abuse, taking a frying pan, beating your child, punching your child in the face type. Like that type of abuse, not the you know, you did something wrong, so I'm going to beat you with the belt type of abuse. Because I, I don't consider that abuse. That's just, you know, rearing. Um, but, yeah. Um, and then I'm going to draw an arrow because, basically, this leads to something. So, it leads to unnecessary justification. For child to rebel okay so that's what I'm gonna write for that and then hopefully you guys can see that um, so parents should not be unkind harsh abusive or overcritical because it leads to unnecessary justification for a child to rebel and again rebelling is something really natural to us and obeying is really hard so we really we you know we try hard to obey and rebelling is fairly easy to do um, so when you give that child a reason they now feel justified in their actions and you never want to give them justification for their sin which is rebelling if that makes sense um, but then it says but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord so basically parents are not to just scold or admonish us um, or rather their children they are expected to train and teach them as well so not only are you going to rebuke your child when they're doing something wrong but you're also supposed to encourage and a lot of parents don't know that um, or don't tend to do that rather um, even when disciplining parents need to have self control so if your child does something that they should not be doing it does not justify you justify you it does not mean that you go and overreact in your discipline like sometimes i watch parents um here okay example when you take a two-year-old to a candy store or like a store in general um and they start asking for things and then i see parents beat their children for asking for things um in that type of situation i feel like you need to have self-control because one you took a toddler into a store um they're toddlers and two that's not the type of um discipline you need to be giving your child for asking for something um you know so i feel like you know parents when it comes to disciplining they need self-control and um i can say for myself there has been times no, i don't abuse my son i don't <laughs> that never happens but you know as parents sometimes i know for uh me being a stay-at-home mom sometimes i get like really irritated because after some time things start to bother me so i find that i have to pull myself away from my son sometimes like if he's in the room doing something and it's like starting to like um I don't want to say irritate me, but like get to me. 
and I find that I'm getting ready to like raise my voice at him, I literally have to remove myself to calm myself down because um, it's not that he's doing it on purpose. It's just that he's a toddler and me being a parent, you know, sometimes you, parents get annoyed after some time, especially when you tell your child not to do something over and over and over and over again. And I have a five year old son. My son likes to push buttons. He's at the age where he wants to talk back. Um, so I find myself sometimes like getting ready to like, oh, Jesus. But I literally have to remove myself and bring myself um, into some type of control because I can lash out on him. And I, when I say lash out, I don't mean like throw him or anything like that. Nothing abusive. But the discipline that I want to give him doesn't align with um the action that he's taken if that makes sense um so that's that and then this um okay so this part right here where it says fathers do not provoke your children to anger but fathers bring them up in discipline and instruction of the lord um personally i think it's given more soul to fathers because they should have a major part in their children's upbringing and spiritual growth we all know that women are nurturers we know that women um you know they bear the children they take care of the children they feed them they clothe them um they help them with education like mothers do a lot but um fathers honestly have or they should have a major part in a child's upbringing not just financially um but more so on uh, emotional mental and spiritual kind of growth but unfortunately it doesn't work that way you know for some men um so i have a few cross references here i'm not gonna read all of them i think i have like six here i i'm just not reading all of them but um hold on let me see hmm So Proverbs 22 and 6, okay, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is, again, Proverbs 22 and 6. I hope I didn't say 22 and 3. I meant Proverbs 22 and 6. Hopefully I said that. I'm going to write these down, though, so um, in a second. The next one I'm going to read is Psalms 78 and 4, which says, We will not hide them from their children telling to the generation to come i'm sorry we will not hide them from their children telling to the generation to come the praises of the lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done um so yeah i am going to underline this bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the lord I hope this is all making sense okay um and then over here i'm gonna write verse four again and then I'm going to put um, Psalms 78.4 and then Proverbs 22.6. And then the note that I have for this is parents are to encourage. teach, train, and rebuke. And when I mean rebuke, um, I'm more so talking about a discipline type of thing. Um, when disciplining, have self-control, Fathers should have major part. I hope you guys are seeing this major part in upbringing and spiritual growth of children okay so that's it for the first paragraph okay so what i'm gonna do is add my color because you know i like color um so i'm just gonna use this blue because i picked it up
just bear with me. I think what I'm going to start doing is when I do these parts, when I'm like underlining because I don't really talk, I might just speed them up. <laughs> um, just because I feel like that would be best to do. Uh oh. Good time. Now we have come to verse 5 through 9, and this one is on bond servants and masters. So I'm just going to read it through. Verse 5 says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will. Yeah, with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Verse 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Verse 9, masters do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master. Yeah, I'm sorry. Knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Alrighty. And for this, we have eye service in verse 6. People pleasers in verse 6. And you know what I want to do is fear. So I'm going to actually pull that up right now. And what I'm going to do is actually show you guys how I do that. So I'm going to circle fear. I don't have that one written down, so I'm going to have to write that down. But um, I just dropped my remote on the floor that's okay I'm gonna use eye service brown people pleasers we're gonna use the green I'm gonna tell you the definitions in a second for that I need to write down fear. And for fear, I want to use brown again because why not? All right. So, before I dive into that, um, I say this. Here's the Greek word for that, and it means service performed only under the eye of the master. So it's basically when you only perform your work under the eye of the master and not other people. And then people pleasers, the Greek word is here, and it is studying to please men, courting the favor of men. So it's basically when you're not seeking to please God, but you're doing it for man. Um, and eye service is when you're doing things only under the ma the um the attention of the master. Okay, so fear. I know I've probably defined fear multiple times before but here's my phone and i'm going to use bible hub i'm going to type in the verse so this is going to be ephesians 6 verse 5 right 5 yes verse 5 okay so on bible hub you will see this section even on the actual website um it is a i think that's parallel sermons i'm not sure what top is but str is strong so that's commentary that's interlinear and then you're going to see greek or sometimes if you're in the old testament it'll say hebrew you're going to click on the greek or hebrew button and then it will break it down parallel in the greek translation versus english with the strong's number in the morphology it's called text analysis. I love using this to get definitions all the time. So, um, here is fear. That's what I'm looking for is fear. So, here's fear. That is the Greek word and the Strong's number, wrong Strong's number I just hit. <laughs> Strong's number is going to be 5401. 
So we're going to hit 5401 because I want to get the definition of that, right? Because we understand that there's a different fear. Um, so it will give you all the breakdown. So it gives you the Strong's number of the Greek word, Strong's concordance. Again, the Greek word with different definitions. The original word, part of speech, transliteration, phonetic spelling. It gives you definition and usage. Then it says help word studies. Um, so I would go down to where, oh. It says Thayer's Greek lexicon, and that's pretty much how I use it to understand the term in that actual uh, scripture, if that makes sense. So it's giving you the definition and for what actual scriptures it's used in. So I'm just going to look for Ephesians 6, 5. Here we go. So um, unto that ye may fear, which is in Ephesians 6, 5. So I'm going to keep going so for fear so dread or terror would basically be that so i'm gonna write greek word i think it's phobos <laughs> how you say this so yeah phobos um meaning Dread or terror. So I just wanted to get the definition. So I just showed you guys how to do it yourselves. But okay. We got that out of the way. And I think that's it for um, defining words personally that I want to define. Obviously you would take this time to define whatever words you want to define um, for your understanding. I would even define partiality. But I just didn't. But you guys get it right. Okay. So going in with verse 5 oops sorry verse 5 and let's see if i can fix this camera all right hopefully this is a little closer and better for you guys to see um so it says bond servants obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would christ so what this is basically telling me is that we are to honor those who are placed in power with a true heart um, as a worker we need to work as if we're working for christ and not just for a random boss okay so obey your earthly masters with a sincere heart as you would christ okay um and basically obey those Placed in power slash authority. Okay, pretty much is what that's saying. Like, as simple as that. Um, and I do have a cross-reference. Let me scroll to it. Cross-reference is... Okay, I need to update my Bible app or something. Cross reference is going to be First Peter's chapter, First Peter chapter two, verse eighteen, where it says, "Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh." So, when I read that, what I immediately think of are the cops <laughs> in this world. Okay. Um, it's telling us to obey our earthly masters, not only to the good and gentle ones, but also to those bad cops with the nasty attitudes that are very judgmental. Yeah, um, that's what I think of. And um, it's not that we're honoring and obeying them as they are just man, but you're doing that because we understand that they are in the position that they are in for purpose by God. So we are to respect them and obey them as if we were doing it to Christ. So again, that's second, ooh, sorry, that's first Peter chapter two, verse 18. Okay. Alrighty. Then in verse six, it says, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, 
So we should never work to just please people or do good when the boss is looking, okay? When we think like that, we are thinking on a earthly kind of natural sense. We're basically thinking carnally. That's what I wanted to say. We're thinking carnally and not spiritually. And I think for me, that was a problem for a while. Um, not that I was, you know, working to please people or to please my boss, but I was not thinking of my jobs as um, working for Christ. You know, I was thinking of it on a carnal sense as I'm working for a person to make some money. Um, but now when I think about it, if I would have had that mindset of I'm doing this job um, and it was given to me from God and that I need to work at this job to honor God. I probably would have enjoyed my jobs a lot more. <laughs> so it says not by the way of eye service as people pleasers. So never work to please people or do good when boss looking. work as if for god because i mean in all actuality he gave us the jobs you know so um we need to do those jobs for him and not for man and this also kind of reminds me of even within the church um not just you know our actual you know jobs that give us paychecks but within the church there are people who want to be ministers and pastors and bishops and whatnot to please other bishops to please other pastors they do this for man and not for god and i'm just like it's crazy that people are literally in the church on the pulpit doing it for eye service and to please people and not god it just it blows my mind honestly um but going on to verse seven it says rendering service with a good will as to the lord so all the work that we do is not for man it has no purpose for man um but um it's for christ and for God's purpose, okay? So rendering service with the goodwill as to the Lord and not to man. All we do is not for man, but for Christ and God's purpose okay verse 8 it says um whatever good anyone does this he will receive from the lord so basically god will return to us in the same measure that we have worked hard our work does not go unnoticed and a lot of the times we tend to think that um god overlooks us i know for me i used to think that a lot especially with my own family um i see my um my my younger brother well all my all my siblings are younger than me but one of my brothers um he's a musician and for the longest i'm not gonna lie i used to be jealous of him because um we're both my my, ta my family is um very talented very musically inclined very artistic um, and for the longest, I used to be jealous of my brother because he has, like, so many opportunities to travel. He's working with celebrities and things like that. And um, I've had the opportunities, but they were, like, snippets. Whereas my brother's doing, like, big things. I mean, like, big things. He's currently on tour with Mario and I think B2K. Um, he is now playing for Damien Escobar. Um, you know, he's been traveled. He's traveled all over. I mean... He's been to Asia a couple of times. He's been to Europe plenty of times. He plays for a choir. Like, my brother's doing a lot. And um, I used to think that the things that I did were unnoticed, honestly. But um, in all actuality, God was just storing them up for a specific time and a specific purpose. Even if he's not going to reward me here on earth, I know that when I go to heaven, the works that I've done um, will not go unnoticed. I will be rewarded in heaven. And, um... You know, it's hard. We we don't tend to think about that. But, um, yeah, so it says, whatever good everyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. So, where can I put this? God will 
return to us in the same I'm sorry I'm hitting the camera <laughs> in the same measure that we worked we never go unnoticed okay um the cross reference for that is going to be Romans 2 at 6 it says who will render to each one according to his deeds um Yeah, so that's basically in reference to, like, righteous judgment. Um, God will render to you according to your deeds. So, Romans 2 and 6. Okay. Going to verse 9, it says, Masters do the same to them. Um, yeah, so masters do the same to them. Basically, as bosses, they should not abuse their power or authority. Um, they are to work just as hard and equally as hard as, you know, their workers do. So just as, um, we, those, and it, it says bond servants, but you can replace that with workers or whatever some bibles might even say slaves but um i'm gonna change it up to like modern times and say workers employees um I'm, yeah employees um so just as we are to obey them um especially with them being placed in power and authority and um we are to do our work as we're doing it unto god and not to man they are to do the same thing they are to honor us and obey and not obey in a sense but honor us as well as if they're honoring God. It's a two-way street. And again, we saw this when he talked about children and children and parents. We saw this when he talked about wives and husbands. It's the same thing. He's just breaking it down for different um, kind of areas of life, if that makes sense, you know? So, um, I'm going to put that over here. Do not... abuse power I mean because it's pretty once you write do not abuse power it's kind of pretty self-explanatory <laughs> okay um, and then it says their master and yours is in heaven that there is no partiality with him so I'm going to underline that and um Basically, God does not pick favorites and he does not discriminate. We all will see him and we will all be judged. We are all equal in his eyes. And um, this kind of reminds me of the whole idea. Of, it has nothing to do with this like specific topic of bond servants and masters. But it reminds me of the whole idea of God seeing rapists and murderers on the same. He's seeing somebody that steals and somebody that kills on the same ground, okay? Um, so the same thing with an employee and an employer. The employer might feel like because they have authority and power, they're um, higher rent. But when you're looking at it on a spiritual sense, it's you're not higher rent spiritually. You're all on the same ground. You're all equal before God because we all needed Christ to die for us. Simple as that. Um, so I'm just trying to flip to the cross reference for you guys. Um, Yeah, my app is, like, bugging out, but, um, let's write the note first, and then I will give you guys the cross-reference. We are almost done. Oh, my gosh. Um. God does not have favorites or discriminate. all equal and then I'm going to say Deuteronomy 10 and 17 I have other cross references but that's the only one I'm going to share right now 
Again, if you do want all the all the cross references and detailed notes, um, which is basically all that I'm reading from is the notes that I have. Um, you can download those on the blog. The link is down below. But um, Deuteronomy ten seventeen says, "For the Lord is your God." I'm sorry, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. So this right here is telling us that it don't matter. Okay, it don't matter if you're the employer, the CEO, the CFO, if you're a janitor, you all equal to God. All equal. Society might not see you as equal, but that is the world. The world will see you differently than God sees you. So, um... Yeah, I just love that verse, okay? I do. So, let's add some color, obviously. Um, so, yeah, let me know what you guys' thoughts are so far with the studies. I know a lot of you guys will, tell, like, will send me emails and stuff, and I truly appreciate that. Oopsie. I forgot to also highlight this part. But yeah, a lot of you will send me emails and stuff, and I truly appreciate that. Um, you don't have to feel nervous to send me an email. I'm always open to looking at emails. I know I have, like, a few emails I actually need to, like, respond to. If not tonight, then tomorrow. Um, but I'm always open to emails, whether it's, like, just to say hi or you want to chat about, you know, a specific scripture or something like that. I am always open to conversing with you all. And I do want to shout out the men that watch my channel because when I get emails from you guys, I honestly get blown away. Like, I I sit in awe. Be, oh, you guys can't even see what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just adding color. Oh, my God. Sorry. But um, I honestly, I sit in awe when I see the things that um, get emailed to me from men because I honestly never thought men um, would watch my channel. Honestly, like, truthfully. Um, and that's just because a lot of men, especially within ministry, they um, tend to think themselves, you know, higher up, if that's the way to say it. Um, so, like, I truly get astonished and, like, I literally cry when I read emails and messages and comments from men, um, you know, who are actually supporting my channel. Like, it amazes me and um, it, it lets me know that I'm, I'm doing the you know good work for god and that um there is purpose in what i'm doing not just for women but also for men so you know all right and now we're on to the armor of god and i mean if you don't know what the armor of god is then like come on <laughs> literally but um let's read it through so the whole armor of god and this is going to be basically verses 10 through 20 so it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming all the flaming darts of the evil one. Yes. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance and making supplication for all the saints. And also for me that the words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth. I'm sorry, in the opening my mouth boldly. Going back, verse 19. And also for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, I personally had no words that I wanted to define, but obviously at this point, you would go in and circle words that you personally wanted to define, okay? So, verse 10, it says, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. So, you get your strength from the Lord and no one else. Simple as that. Strength comes from God, and um, there is a cross-reference, but um, hold on. Strength only comes from 
from God. That's a terrible G. Oh gosh. <laughs> that like that's that's a hideous G, honestly. But um the cross reference. It's going to be 1 Samuel 30 and 6. And I'm going to read that in a second. If we can um, get these together. Okay. So, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So, strength only comes from God. That's 1 Samuel 30 and 6. And it reads... Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all people, all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Um, and this, I believe, at the time was when um, David and his men and their people were staying in, in Ziklag. And um, the Amalekites, I think it was, the Am Amalekites, yeah, they invaded and burned down um, their kind of... Uh, village town I don't know what to call it but they burned down their place and took captive the women and um you know the people were angry with David and instead of David reacting towards their anger and their spitefulness he took strength and sought strength from God um really great definitely should read it um but yeah so be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might strength comes only from God and I'm going to underline and highlight as I go to make this easier. Alrighty. Moving on, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So what I'm going to do is underline all that. And basically, once you are strengthened, you need to put on the armor so that you can now be effective against the enemy and his schemes. He prepared us by giving us battle equipment and he being God. So what I'm going to write is. Once strengthened. Put on. Battle equipment. He prepared for us. Um, I'm just going to say prepared. And so once strengthened, put on battle equipment he prepared. And again, what I said is once you are strengthened, you need to put on the armor so that you can be effective against the enemy and his schemes. Yes, I'm going to say that prepared to be effective against... The enemy and his schemes. Because, I mean, you can always do something, but it's like, really, are you are you being effective in that, um, in what you're doing? So, um, the cross-reference is going to be 2 Corinthians... Six and seven. And that says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Um, so the armor, which is the armor of God, at least that's what I'm getting from that. So Alrighty. I'm going to use this pretty green color because I just I'm obsessed with this color. This is so random, guys, but I think tonight what I'm going to do after I am done recording this, I am recording this late at night, um, I'm probably going to watch a little bit of something like something on Netflix and do some coloring, maybe. I haven't colored in a minute and I'm really in a mood to color. So random. So random. <laughs> um, okay. Moving on to verse 12. It says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Okay. So I'm going to write down here, if you guys can see, because I don't have any space. Verse 12. Um, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Basically, our battles are not physical. Let's 
spiritual. And for that, the cross-reference is 2 Corinthians 10, 3, and 4. Which it says, For though we walk in flesh, we do not war according to flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So, again, that's 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4. And that just like, ooh, that speaks a word there. All right. Going back up, it says, um, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present uh, darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So basically, these are a few of the things that we battle against daily. They are not in the physical realm. They are not of the physical realm, but of the spiritual. Um, an army is devised, organized, and established into ranks under the headship of Satan to destroy us. So... Um, you know, an example is like when you're arguing with your siblings, like say you're arguing with your siblings out of the blue, out of the blue. And that actually tends to happen a lot. And um, now that I'm older and I, I look at things more spiritually, I can understand now um, how the enemy has definitely been working within my family. Not to say that we don't get into arguments because we get, you know, we're children. But um, there has been times where like me and my brother, like me and my brother, um, the one I was telling you guys that I sometimes get jealous about, um, jealous over. Um, he and I, we used to, like, go at it, y'all. And I don't mean, like, just straight-up arguments. I mean, like, we would fight. It was bad. We would fight. Um, and the crazy thing is, my brother and I, we have the deepest love for one another. Like, if someone does something that's outside of, like, the family, like, we are ready to bat. Like, my brother will fight for me. I will fight for him. It's happened, okay? <laughs> but, um, me and him, we go head to head i mean on some crazy stuff guys and um before i would fight him physically but when i read that verse when i read verse 12 it makes me open my eyes and see that a lot of the times especially when things have been like really good and then all of a sudden we going at each other's necks or if he went out and he had a bad day and he come home and he starts like going off I start to see that it's not really just a tension between us, but it's the enemy trying to bring strife and separation within us. Um, the enemy definitely seeks to destroy my family. I, I can say that for a fact. He definitely seeks to destroy my family. My family is um, gifted or not. I'm not just saying it because they're my family, but I'm saying it because like it's spiritually like honestly true. Um, and I can see now sitting back like when things happen, like with my younger sister, um, well, my baby sister, she's the only one. My baby sister. We go at it a lot. And before, I used to spaz out. Like, no lie, I would spaz out on her. But now I just sit back, look at her in her face, and um, I have to pray for her. Because my sister, uh, she's 13, going on 14. So, um, I think around 12, she gave her life to Christ. Like, she personally gave her life to Christ. And the day that she did that, after she gave her life to Christ, um... You know, her whole being started to change, like, on a spiritual level. I could see it, and it was not pretty. It was not pretty. And, um, you know, once a child gives themselves to Christ and becomes saved on their own, by their own choice and their own decision, the enemy will try to wreak havoc. And, I mean, it was crazy for a minute. Um, and I had to pray. You know, my mom sat and spoke to me and told me that I had to pray for her. And I was able to actually see, um, in a spiritual sense, what was going on. And it was, it was, cra it was crazy, you guys. So verse 12 is completely true. Moving on. Um, verse 13, it says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So with God's armor, we can, I'm sorry, without God's armor, we cannot be effective in battle against the enemy and his forces. I'm looking at these notes. Anybody who has previously purchased the Ephesians Bible study notes, just know I have updated notes coming. Um, I literally have to go back and update these notes because they're terrible. Like literally here, I say with God's armor, we cannot be effective. I meant to say without God's armor. So 
I'm going to be editing these notes um, and then sending out a bulk email to everyone that did already previously purchase because these notes got to get it right, got to get it right, okay. Um, so, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So, without God's armor, cannot be effective against enemy um, but I'm going to read the entire note that I wrote so um, without God's armor we cannot be effective in battle against the enemy and his forces spiritual armor gives us protection and God gives us strength to stand against their attacks the armor helps us to stand in grace the gospel courage strength faith liberty unity the Lord and the will of God okay so again, for that, you can read 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, which says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And then I have another cross-reference, which is going to be Luke 12 and 35. If I can get to that quickly. Luke 12 and 35 says, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Okay? So I'm just going to write 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. And I mean, honestly, ask yourself, have you ever tried to fight the enemy on your own? And then have you tried to fight him with God's uh, armor? There's a difference. Um, on our own, on our own, we may think we can battle and um, fight the enemy, but we can't. We, we weak. Um, and the enemy knows us very well. He knows what ticks us off. He knows what what um, temptations he can bring to us he knows exactly what will get our attention and um, when we try to do it in our own strength it, it just it's not possible and that's what I, I love about this is that it starts off by saying be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might and then you put on his armor because um you can put on his armor and have no strength and when you try to use your own strength with his armor it's a hot mess you might as it, it's it's a hot mess okay <laughs> So, you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing, okay? It's amazing. I don't know why I'm putting that there. So, we gonna use this orange color. I don't know if this is in frame. Okay, it is. <laughs> this video might be cut into like three parts that I might have to put together. But, um, okay. Moving on to verse 14, it says, fasten, where is it at? 13, fasten on the belt of truth. Okay, so the belt of truth puts on the biblical beliefs of the Christian as a whole. Truth basically gears up the rest of the armor so that we can effectively fight. Putting on your belt means you are prepared for action. So therefore, when you put the belt of truth on, you're prepared for anything that will be said or done. Because you know truth versus um, falsehood. Okay? So. Ooh. I'm probably going to have to write those notes all down here. So. <laughs> um, I'm going to say truth. Gears up. The rest of armor. So can effectively fight putting on belts means you are prepared. Okay, and then it says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. This is about to get crazy in this note section, so beware ahead of time, guys. Um, so, 
put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate protects the vital organs. Um, and when I'm talking about the belt and the breastplate, I'm talking about an actual armor, like, you know, war battlefield type armor. Okay. So the breastplate, the purpose of it was to protect the vital organs. So we need the righteousness received by faith in Christ, which gives us a sense of confidence and an awareness of our standing and position. The breastplate of righteousness is our best defense against the sense of spiritual depression and the gloom that comes against us, okay? I just said a mouthful, I know. Um, it's, it's honestly better if you had the actual notes in front of you because I'm saying a lot. So, um, breastplate protects vital organs um, need righteousness to give Confidence and awareness of position and standing. Um, the cross references I have were in Isaiah. So let's flip to Isaiah quickly. Isaiah 11 and 5, I believe that's what that says. It says, Righteousness shall be the belt of the loin of his loins and faithfulness. The belt of his waist. And then Isaiah 59, 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. So Isaiah. Again, you guys don't have to pay attention to the notes that I'm writing because I know it could look like chicken scratch. <laughs> But um, if you need to, you can slow down the video now that uh, YouTube makes it easy. If you're looking on like your computer, it's easier for you to slow down the audio on a video. You can speed up the audio on a video or whatever. So um, yeah, if you don't purchase the notes, this is an that's another way that you can um, really get what I'm saying if I'm speaking too fast. Let's get some colors because this is about to get crazy. Okay, this is this about to be crazy to look at. So Okay. Now let's use the purple color. Let me just put my other highlighters here so that I could quickly get to them. Okay. Um, then on 15, it says, Shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Okay. Um, so for that, basically the gospel should be your foundation as you tread the earth. Just as shoes protect your feet from the harsh ground, the gospel of peace will give you the footing that you need. However powerful the rest of your body is, if you're wounded in your feet, you are easy prey for the enemy. So, um, I just, I think that's amazing. Like, seriously amazing. Um, the gospel of peace should be your foundation. It protects your feet. It protects you. Um, as you walk this earth, so. Shoes protect feet from damage. Gospel of Peace.
Gibbs footing needed. Um, I have cross references for that. It's going to be in the book of Isaiah again. <laughs> so that's Isaiah 52 and 7. Um, and it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news being the gospel, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So that's again Isaiah 52 and 7. And then I have Romans 10 and 15. And that says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, How beautiful are your feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So, Romans 10, 15. Okay. 16 says the shield of faith. I'm just going to underline quickly so that I'm not going to be like taking forever. Um, so the shield of faith is one and then with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So, the shield of faith. A shield protects the whole body from long-range and short-range attacks. This was not an armor that you had all the time, but when you needed it. So, it was there to protect you. So, faith keeps us from being weakened by fear and unbelief. So, the shield protects long and short-range Faith keeps us from being weakened by fear and unbelief. Cross reference is going to be First John 5 and 4. And I'm not going to read that because I don't want this <laughs> video to be like extremely long. I know I'm going to have to do some crazy editing for this. So that's that. And then it says, with which you can extinguish um, all the flaming darts of the evil one. So I'm going to come down here and write verse 16. Right? 16, yes. Verse 16. Um, and basically, with your faith, the enemy's darts must turn back. The darts are basically those kind of, you know, depressing thoughts, those terrible feelings that we have, those things that we tend to imagine, the fears and the lies that are hurled at us. When we have faith, those things that he throws at us have to turn back so faith turns back enemies darts and in parentheses I'm going to put thoughts lies feelings okay Okay. Um, 17, it says, the helmet of salvation. And then it says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So, I'm going to use this green for the helmet of salvation.
and then this pink for the sword of the spirit which is the word of god down here i'm going to write the helmet of salvation so the helmet protected the head salvation protects us against discouragement against the desire to give up um from giving i'm sorry hold on <laughs> yeah so uh the helmet protects the head Salvation protects us against discouragement, desire to give up, um, giving us hope not only in knowing that we are saved, but that we will be safe. It's the assurance that God will triumph, protects us. Um, assurance. God will triumph. And then when it says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, um, I'm sorry, which is here. So the helmet of salvation, which I just said, and then it says the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So um, that basically is that the sword was used to cut down an enemy. So sword used to cut down enemy okay so the sword is used to cut down an enemy so understand that the spirit gives us the sword and the sword is the word of god you need it to practice more effectively um before you i'm sorry you needed to practice before effectively using your sword and it's the same thing with us we need to practice and train with our sword with um which is the word of god and we do that through studying and praying scripture so the word can cut down enemy i'm not gonna write the other portions because that's just way too much okay okay so no, i'm not gonna make any lines it's gonna be too much i feel weird with no lines yeah this is gonna be like the craziest page ever Verse 18 says, praying at all times in the spirit with all um, with all prayer and supplication. So there are several kinds of prayer and we, we need to use them all. We don't need to just pray one type of prayer. We are supposed to pray all types of prayer. Um, and we need to think of prayer as the shine to our armor. Your prayer life can either be dull. I'm sorry. Your prayer life can either dull your armor or shine it. Okay. So. Prayer life is shine to armor, is what I'm going to say, okay? And then it says, um, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all saints. So, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Um, it's basically saying, don't just go battle for yourself, but for others as well in the body of Christ and for unbelievers, okay? Um, so... Don't battle for self. Only battle for others. It's really as simple as that, um, battle for others. Um, and then you can read other cross references. You can look that up. I'm not going to go through that because it's going to be crazy. You guys clearly can't see. Oh my god. <laughs> Clearly can't see and I'm not paying no attention. So I'm going to take this gray and use praying all the time in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Then we're going to take this pencil from Crayola. Okay. 
Okay. Hope you guys can see that. I feel like this is a little blurry. Don't know why. Okay. Verse 19, it says, That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So, just as Paul wanted prayers for boldness to speak the gospel, we too need to pray the same for ourselves and for others, okay? Down here, I'm going to write verse 19. Pray for boldness to speak. Speak the gospel. Cross reference is going to be Acts 4 and 29. Um, we're going to use blue just because I really like this blue color. And I do have other things, but um, then in verse 20, it says, I am an ambassador in chains. So Paul considered his prison chains to be an adornment for, I'm sorry, he basically considered his prison chains to be an adornment of an ambassador of Christ, okay? So Christ suffered and wore the crown. Um, what we go through can be an adornment for God to. For us to God, I'm sorry. Um, what we go through can be an adornment for us to God, okay? So, though he was locked up in chains in prison in Rome... I think that was in Rome at this time when he, I think he was locked up in Rome when he wrote this. Um, he didn't just look at them as like prison chains. He looked at it as in a way, as a adornment unto Christ. He was like, yeah, I'm locked up in these chains, but um, these chains don't mean nothing because I'm an ambassador for Christ. And, you know, because Christ suffered, we suffered. We will suffer. Hopefully I'm making sense, okay? I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> My notes make sense, kind of, sort of, so bear with me. All right, and now we're allowed to the last paragraph, which is great because I'm running out of space <laughs> to record. So it says, final greetings, so that you may also know who, I'm sorry, so that you may also know how I am and what I am doing. Tychus, I think that's how you say that. Tychus, the beloved brother and faithful minister and the Lord will tell you everything. Verse 22, I have sent him to you for both. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and what and that he may encourage your heart. Sorry. Peace be to peace be to the brothers in love with faith from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 24. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. OK, so. Verse 22, it says um, that he may encourage your hearts. Basically, Paul sent this letter through Tychus as a comfort to the Ephesians, okay? Letter sent to comfort Ephesus, um, which is the church, the church of Ephesus. So though it may sound like crazy, he's he specifically had this letter sent out to be an encouragement, okay? Verse 23, it says, Peace be to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul gives a push for peace, love, and faith. And then verse 24, it says, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. 
Paul closes with a blessing, and you'll see that all the time. He begins and ends his letters the same way, with a blessing um, to the people. So, that is it, ladies and gentlemen. If you are watching, that is it for this study. I don't even know where to stick this, so I'm going to stick it probably over here. Because I just have way too many notes. But um, here's my definitions. I'm just going to stick it on the other post-it note over here. But, um, yes, that's, that's, that's it, guys. I'm going to quickly zoom out. Oops, sorry, that's my chair. I'm going to zoom out quickly. And, yes, we have completed Ephesians, guys. So, Ephesians is done. Notes everywhere. Notes everywhere. We're done, guys. We are done with Ephesians. And um, what that means is that we are done with using the ESV translation for now. Um, not for good, but just for now because I will be transitioning into using the New King James because that is the translation I personally prefer to study with. Um, I definitely will, you know, use the ESV down the line as well as the CSB and other translations because I do have other translations on hand. But um, I definitely want to start doing these studies with the um, New King James. So I thank you so much, ladies, in the Daughter of Increase Facebook group. Thank you so much for your patience and your, you know, you know, your time. I know I was supposed to do live sessions for five and six and i didn't get a chance to so thank you guys for that thank you to all who are watching the study and enjoying the study um leave your comments leave your thoughts down below um you can email me dota of increase at gmail.com you can dm me on instagram you can talk to me on facebook all the links are down below um again if you want the notes um for the study um, like an actual physical copy of the notes, you can purchase them from the blog. Um, I have Ephesians notes as well as the notes for the March Bible study, which will be Jonah. But, um, yeah, thank you all for your patience, your time, your support, and your love. And I will see you guys in the next Bible study session, Bible study video, the next video I do. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Mm -hmm.